Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 through 54. And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. Ephesians chapter 5 verses 31 and 32 For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the Church. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, members of 3,800 branch churches all over the world, including the United States, Canada, Honduras, Peru, Argentina, Germany, France, Russia, Belgium, Netherlands, and African countries, including Kenya, Uganda, and Congo, and in China, Japan, Pakistan, Indonesia, Philippines, Taiwan, India, Mongolia, Egypt, and Korean branch churches and local sanctuary members, those who are attending the service on the Internet, all over the world, and television viewing audiences. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 verses 1 to 2 says, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ, as stewards of the mysteries of God. In this case, moreover, it is required of stewards that one be found trustworthy. Servants of Christ are the stewards of the mysteries of God. This mystery is the method to gain eternal life, which is hidden since before the time began. Now, God does not want to keep it secret anymore, but make it known to all peoples around the world. He wants all who hear to accept Jesus Christ and gain eternal life. If you believe in the Lord, heaven and hell, and that you are saved, you should preach as the stewards of the mysteries of God. You should lead many dying souls to gain life. You should guide them so that they will gain peace and comfort found in the love of God. This is the 18th session of the message of cross. Through these messages of cross, you can systematically understand the secrets of the gospel and the way of salvation. I hope you will keep this message in your heart and have perfect faith so that you will be able to save numerous souls by diligently preaching the gospel. I pray in the name of the Lord that you will be praised in heaven by God who will say, Well done, my good and faithful sons and daughters. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, as I explained through the last session, Jesus, who was hung on the cross, left us seven final statements and breathed his last. Matthew chapter 27 verses 51 to 54 talk about some amazing things that took place immediately after Jesus' death. It says, And behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, the rocks were split, and the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. Now the centurion and those who were with him keeping guard over Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were happening, became very frightened and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. The centurions and those who were keeping guard over Jesus 
were so surprised to see the things that happened by the power of God. It was not about the resurrection of Jesus. They were afraid that the rocks were split and there was an earthquake. The veil of the temple being torn down and torn in two from top to bottom symbolizes that the wall of sin between the sinners and God was torn down. In the temple of the Old Testament are the holy place and the most holy place and there was a veil in front of the most holy place so nobody could enter that place. Only the chief priest could go inside the veil with the sin offering and offer the sacrifice for sinners. Not even the priests could go in there. Only the chief priest went in once a year for the sin offering. It was because sinners could not communicate with God. Comparing the most holy place with this sanctuary, this upper stage can be the most holy place. There was curtain between this upper altar and the holy place so that the inside would not be seen. But after Jesus himself became the atoning sacrifice, the veil of the temple was torn in two. In the same way, the wall of sin between God and his children was torn down. Now we came to be able to communicate with God by the precious blood of the Lord. So Hebrews chapter 10 verses 19 to 20 says, Since therefore, brethren, we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus. You are here in the holy place of the Lord, and by whose grace is it? You have the confidence to be in the holy place by the blood of Jesus. By a new and living way which he inaugurated for us through the veil that is his flesh. The flesh here is not the flesh that we use to refer to the works of the flesh or the things of the flesh. It is just about a physical body. Because Jesus Christ shed his blood for us, we can come in to the holy place and communicate with God directly. As it is said, effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much when a man who is blameless and loved by God makes earnest intercessions with faith and love, God may give one more chance of repentance through the request of the one who is loved by God so much. Also, when you sin against a brother, sometimes you should repent directly to him so that he will pray for the forgiveness of your sins. For example, when Aaron and Miriam stood against Moses, God forgave them through the intercession prayer of Moses. When Job's friends sinned against Job, Job prayed for them and God forgave those friends through that prayer. Job was suffering from boils all over his body. They were so itchy that he was scratching with potsherd. Even his wife and his maid servants were looking down on him. His friends came and didn't even comfort him, but rather they accused him, saying it was because of his sins. But what did God say about it when he met with Job? The friends were more evil than Job, but they still condemned the good Job. So God did not forgive the sins of his friends. Instead, God told Job to pray for his friends for the forgiveness of their sins. When Job prayed, God forgave their sins. But basically, repentance should be made in the name of the Lord 
before the Father God. It is the same with all kinds of prayers. We offer our heart directly to God through Jesus Christ, who tore down our walls of sin and became our mediator. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, after Jesus' death, the veil of the temple was torn in two, and also there was an earthquake. It says the earth shook and the rocks were split. This happened because God, the ruler of heavens and earth, grieved and lamented so much. Even lifeless rocks were split, and it is obvious that all things on the earth shook together. Luke chapter 23 verse 44 says, And it was now about the sixth hour, and darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. Even the sun lost its light. These things took place because God lamented so deeply with heartbreaking pain of giving up His blameless one and only Son as the atoning sacrifice, and He lamented the sorrow of the people who were still living in sins without realizing the fact that Jesus died because of their evilness. Through the summer retreats in this year, I think most of our members realized once again that God the Father controls all the weather conditions and nature. It rained throughout the country, but in your retreat spots, God protected you and gave you good weather. No single program, including sports day, was canceled due to rain. God gave us clouds, so we didn't suffer from the heat. Or even when it rained, it rained during your indoor programs and it stopped just before your indoor program was over. He showed us signs and wonders. Even when the sky was covered with clouds, when you wanted to see stars, the clouds disappeared and God let you see shooting stars. He gave you a cool breeze and blocked all insects away from you so that you could have barbecues without insects. God protected all our retreats for many weeks. So even new believers could feel that God was really with us. Next, in verse 52, it says, Many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep are raised and coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they entered the holy city and appeared to many. The tombs opening here does not mean it was dug up. It's just that the tombs were opened so that those who were asleep could come out of them and go into the holy city. But this holy city does not refer to Jerusalem. It is in physical sense. We don't call the city where people killed Jesus and other prophets shedding so much blood a holy city. The original holy city is something else, which is a city in the kingdom of God. By saying they entered the holy city and appeared to many, it doesn't mean they appeared to anybody. They appeared to the ones whose spiritual lines were opened. But this is such a deep secret that I didn't explain to you yet. When those who are saved finish their lives on this earth, we do not say they died, but that they have fallen asleep. It's because when the Lord comes back again, they will resurrect as if they are waking from a long sleep and participate in the glory of the Lord. Some of the people of the Old Testament times earnestly believed and longed to see the Savior who was prophesied in the Bible. Also, people like Anna and Simeon recognized Jesus as the Savior when he was just a baby before he began his ministry. The chief priests and priests or the scribes and the Pharisees who were supposed to understand the scriptures thoroughly and teach others did not realize Jesus is the Savior even though they saw all the powerful works of God that Jesus performed. 
they rather tried to kill him. But those who longed for the appearing of the Savior, praying and fasting, and those without any evil, recognized even the baby Jesus as the Savior. It's the same today. Those with goodness hear the word of life, and the church filled with life. But those who are evil still persecute these churches, saying they are heretical or something, even though the powerful works of God are being known worldwide. These people had the faith to be saved even though they died before Jesus accomplished the providence of salvation by taking the cross, are said to be asleep. Therefore, the saints who had fallen asleep in today's passage refers to those among the people who had faith to be saved but who had died before Jesus died on the cross. And as said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 20, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. The saints who had fallen asleep were able to participate in the resurrection, but only after Jesus became the first fruit of the resurrection. Viewing audiences, the believers who believe in Jesus Christ as their Savior will resurrect in body at the end and also understand that at the moment of accepting the Lord, their spirit is resurrected. Namely, they gain eternal life. So you resurrected in spirit. Those who have accepted Jesus as the Savior and received the Holy Spirit, resurrected in spirit. You will not have physical resurrection because you will receive the Lord alive. If you die today or tomorrow, you will have to resurrect in body also, but you will be caught in the air alive and receive the Lord, so you will not have the resurrection of your body. Today's passage, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 31 to 32 says, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. It is not about the worldly people, it is about Christ and the church. When people get married, they leave their parents, and the husband and wife become one. This is not really a secret, but common knowledge. But why does it say, this mystery is great? In today's passage, it is not about marriage of the worldly people, but it is about the Christ, the church, and the believers. It is about the providence of salvation through the cross, which has been hidden since before time began. John chapter 8 verse 44 says, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. Also, 1 John chapter 3 verse 8 says, The one who participates, the one who practices sin is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. Sin here refers to sins committed in action. It is not about things of the flesh or the sinful natures, but the works of the flesh, which are shown as action. If you commit these works of the flesh, you belong to the devil, so you cannot call God Father. God dislikes it very much. Why? You seek the Father only with lips. You belong to the devil and do what the devil wants you to do, committing sins. But you still say you believe and call the Holy God Father, committing the works of the flesh that lead you to death. Then. Does God have children who go to the way of death, belonging to the devil and committing works of the flesh? Of course not. That's why he tells you not to call him father. You can just call him God. But if you are at the first or the second level of faith and call God father with the inspiration or with faith, it is okay. Why? They are still children in spirit. 
But you don't have to call God Father. For these people, God, just God is more comfortable. But as they gain more faith, they cast off sins and go into spirit. Then they will naturally call God Father. Then they will call God Abba Father or Father God or God the Father. But if those who have the faith still commit the works of the flesh that lead to death, you shouldn't call God Father. He dislikes it very much. When people commit sins with their heart and deeds in this sinful world, they are the servants of sin and they are under the control of the enemy devil and Satan. That is why it is said, you are of your father devil. But those who accept Jesus Christ are not the children of the devil anymore. They now belong to God as his children. Also with faith they are united with Jesus Christ as a bridegroom. When we believe that Jesus redeemed us from our sins by taking the cross, we are united with Jesus and become one. When we unite with the Lord, God gives us the Holy Spirit into our heart. As said in John chapter 3 verse 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes to us, He revives our dead spirit and lets us give birth to spirit through the spirit. Giving birth to spirit through the Holy Spirit is to fill our heart with the knowledge of truth. Those who have been given birth to spirit through the Holy Spirit in this way become God's sons and daughters and they can call God Father. If you become God's children, you can inherit the kingdom of God. Viewing audiences, let me elaborate on God's children receiving the Holy Spirit and giving birth to a spirit through the Holy Spirit. Man's heart can be divided into many parts. The easiest distinction is the heart of obvious truth and the heart of obvious untruth. To make it easy, it is a white heart and black heart. A white heart is the heart of truth and goodness that follows truth that God planted into Adam in the beginning. The black heart is the heart of untruth and evil that was planted later by the enemy devil and Satan. When God first created man, he breathed his breath of life into the man, so man had received the seed of life. Then God planted truth in man, so Adam's spirit and his heart was the truth covering the seed of life. At first, Adam's heart was only the white heart that is filled only with truth. But since Adam committed a sin, his communication with God was disconnected, and the enemy devil and Satan began to plant sins and evil, unrighteousness, lawlessness, and untruth. Thus, in Adam's heart, the original white heart and the black heart planted by the enemy devil and Satan came to coexist together. And in addition to these two hearts, another kind of heart was formed. It is the conscience. Conscience is formed through what you input into yourself from what you see, hear, and learn based upon your nature that you inherited from your parents. Conscience is the mixture of truth and untruth, and it serves as the standard of judging different values. This conscience is different per from person to person in different areas and in different times. So when one person says something is right according to his conscience, it cannot be recognized as right by all other people. People's consciences are made by themselves, so they say their conscience is right. They consider themselves right, and they say the other parties are wrong. In this way, they condemn others, saying they don't even have conscience. Some say their conscience is seared as with hot iron, thinking their own conscience is right. How ridiculous it is to say those things, not even knowing that they are condemning other people. There are people who have qualms over even the most trivial lies, while there are also other people who do not have any qualms even after causing such great trouble to other people with their big lies. Some think it is right to pay back evil with evil, 
while some others cannot really pay back evil with evil, even though they are angry. Likewise, all men have different consciences, and in most cases, even the good conscience of men cannot be considered good in the sight of God. For example, if there is a person who endures his anger and resentment within his mind, the worldly people would say he is good, but in God's sight he is not good. Those who truly have good conscience will not have any anger or resentment in the first place. They love even their enemies, understand others, and cover others' wrongdoings. In summation, men's hearts can generally be divided into three parts. Heart of truth, heart of untruth, and conscience. In fact, in the heart of truth which was first planted by God is a rarity in that which is remaining. Also, as we are going towards the end, evil prevails even more, so people's con consciences become more evil too. In most cases, people do not even obey the voice of their conscience but follow their heart of untruth. If they store evil upon evil, their conscience will be seared as with hot iron and they do not even have any sense of guilt even when they commit such evil things. Viewing audiences, I told you that men have the seed of life that was given by God in the beginning. The seed of life can be active only when it communicates with God and is supplied with the truth. But due to Adam's sin, communication with God was disconnected and untruth came into the heart. Thereby, these three different hearts came to surround the seed of life. Among the three, the heart of untruth surrounding the seed of life caused it to become inactive, as the seed of life could no longer be active and it was just as though it was dead. Let me give you an example. Let us say your whole body is buried in the sand or on a beach, or you are buried up to your neck in the ground. You only have your neck up on the ground. Then can you come out of the ground by yourself? No, you cannot move at all. You have your neck up on the ground and you breathe too. You move your eyes too, but you cannot come out by yourself. Somebody has to dig you out. Why? You cannot move at all. You cannot believe it? You can see those things in some movies. They bury other people up to their neck and just leave. Then these people cannot move at all. Once I tried it on myself, I really could not move. It was just sand. But if you bury somebody like that in the ground, he cannot move at all. It's the same. The seed of life is not dead, but is surrounded by other things. So it is just like being dead, not being active. In this state in which the communication with God is disconnected, the seed of life is inactive and surrounded by the untruth. It is what we mean when we say the spirit of man is dead, but it is not that the seed of life is dead completely. It is inactive but is waiting for the day of revival. Just as the seed of a plant seems to be dead, if the life is still in it, it will someday begin to grow as said in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11. He has also said eternity in their heart. Although the seed of life became inactive, it longs for the eternity and the truth of God and is waiting for the day of revival. In Romans, we can find that all things long for the time when all things will be recovered. And when will the spirit of man revive again? It is when we receive the Holy Spirit. When we hear the gospel, the light of God, life and truth is shown on our heart. Then the heart of truth that is remaining in our heart and the good heart accept this light and accept Jesus Christ as the Savior. Then God sends the Holy Spirit into our hearts and this Holy Spirit combines with the seed of life in our heart. In case of those who have much untruth and whose conscience is dirtied, their seed of life is strongly surrounded by the untruth so it is difficult for the light of truth to enter. The more of heart of truth 
And the more of good conscience they have, they more easily accept the gospel and can be born again by the Holy Spirit. Once we receive the Holy Spirit, now the seed of life begins to act. The communication with God, with, which was disconnected since Adam's fall, starts again, and we are supplied with the knowledge of truth again. The heart that is filled with the untruths of hatred, pride, quarrels, anger, and adultery now begins to be filled with truth of love, service, humbleness, and peace. This is the process of giving birth to Spirit through the Holy Spirit, and what we must do in this process is to pray. As we pray with all our strength, we can receive God's grace and strength from above to cast off the untruth of our heart. As we keep on doing this, the heart of truth gains more strength. But if we do not pray, we will just remain as men of flesh. Even though we may seem to be faithful in God's works, we cannot give birth to spirit through the Holy Spirit. It will be just fleshly enthusiasm and fleshly goodness. But even though we pray very hard, it is also useless if we do not break our fleshly thoughts and frameworks. The Holy Spirit moves our heart of truth to follow His desire, and Satan controls the heart of untruth through the soul, namely, through our thoughts. So even if you are a believer, you still receive works of Satan and live with an evilness unless you break your fleshly thoughts. You still condemn other people, break the order, do not obey, and point out the mistakes of your seniors because you think you are always right and you are better than other people. The Bible tells us not to look at the speck of other people. If you can't see those things, you have to take out the plank from your eyes. Then you can see clearly. If we have more untruths, before we receive the works of the Holy Spirit, we are apt to receive the work of Satan through our thoughts leading us to the way of destruction. Although we listened to a lot of truth and pray for a long time, unless we cast off our fleshly thoughts and theories, we cannot follow the works of the Holy Spirit. Even though we pray, we have distress in our heart, and we cannot experience God's works. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 5 says, We are destroying speculations and every lofty thing raised up against the knowledge of God, and we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Even though with prayers we cast off the heart of untruth from among the three kinds of heart, it is not the end of the refinement. After this, we have to find and cast off the evil in our conscience which is hidden in our nature. I told you that conscience is formed through what we input from what we see, hear, and learn based on what we have inherited from our parents. This conscience makes another deep nature of our own, and this is the heart placed deep inside of which even we ourselves are not aware. The untruth in our nature does not agree with the righteousness of God, but to ourselves it is very correct, so it is difficult to find it and cast it off. That is why God allows trials to let us find out the untruth in our nature and to make us completely holy. Even the upright Job had to go through severe trials and they were for him to discover his own righteousness and cast the evils off from within him. Job had already no thrown off the heart of untruth from among the three kinds of hearts, but he had not yet cast off evil in his deep nature. But when he received trials that he could not understand, the evil in his nature was exposed. After his evil was exposed, God met him, and he could repent thoroughly and came to have a perfect heart of truth. If you listen to the word of God with the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and find out and realize yourself, you can quickly cast off untruths in your nature. But no matter how much you listen to God's word, if you think it is about other people and do not realize it within yourself, your growth in faith is slow even after a long period of time. Once you cast off the heart of untruth and also the untruth in your nature, now you only have the heart of truth remaining. Then you will be recognized as a man of spirit before God and you will always experience the spiritual realm. As said in 1 John chapter 3, verses 21 to 22, you do not have anything of blame and nothing to be accused of in a heart, so you gain confidence before God and receive everything you ask for in prayer. Also, as said, if you can, all things are possible to him who believes. Everything is done according to your faith. As the heart of truth combined with the seed of life becomes bigger, we will be one with the Lord and we will stay closer to the throne of God in heaven. Let me conclude the message. Today, 
As said, this mystery is great. I explained to you the process of uniting with the Christ who took the cross and opened the way of salvation for us and gaining eternal life. Believers who accept Jesus Christ have left this world that is controlled by the devil and were united with the Lord our bridegroom. Just as a new life is conceived when the seeds of life are joined, when the believers with faith unite with Jesus Christ our bridegroom, we have eternal life. Jesus said in John chapter 17 verse 21 that they may all be one even as thou father art in me and I in thee that they also may be in us that the world may believe that thou didst send me as the Lord is in the Father and the Father is in the Lord the Lord and the Father are one also just as a man and a woman unite with each other and become one if we unite with the Lord our bridegroom we become one with the Lord and the Father God now do you understand why the Lord is the bridegroom and we are his brides as we cast off untruth from our heart and instead fill it with truth to accomplish heart of spirit, we can become one with God more and more. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 to 7 says, But when the fullness of the time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because we are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son, into our hearts, many misunderstand this part. Because it says the spirit of his son, they think this spirit was born of Jesus. But this spirit is the Holy Spirit, one of the triune God. Each of them is different. The Father, the Son were divided from the Father and they are different. Here it says the spirit of his son because the Holy Spirit is also the spirit of his son. But many people think this spirit was born of Jesus, so they cannot understand the Bible. God has sent forth the spirit of his Son into our hearts, namely, he sent the Holy Spirit and make him combine with the seed of life in our hearts. And let us cry out, Abba, Father. So when the Holy Spirit dwells in our heart and combines with the seed of life, we can open our hearts and understand the word of truth of God so that our spirit can grow up. Galatians chapter 4 verses 4 to 7 says therefore you are no longer a slave but a son and if a son then an ear through God those children who have received the Holy Spirit and are saved can now call God Father and will inherit the kingdom of heaven I hope you will more quickly give birth to Spirit through the Holy Spirit and become one with the Lord and God the Father. I pray in the name of the Lord that by doing this, you will inherit the eternal kingdom of heaven and especially New Jerusalem. I will pray for all those who are sick. Place your hand on sick parts and infirmities of your body and receive this prayer. If you are not ill, place your hand on your chest and receive this prayer for the desires of your heart. The work of the Almighty God transcends time and space. He will also work according to your faith. No matter where you are, when you receive this prayer in faith, you will surely experience the astonishing part of God. Hallelujah, the Almighty God of love. Lay your hand on all your children, on all GCN viewers who receive this prayer on television. Lay your hand and manifest your work that transcends time and space on every viewer who receives this prayer in faith in every corner of the world. Give each of them the faith by which they can believe and drive out all the power of negative thoughts and doubts. Drive out all trials and sufferings. Scorch by the fire of the Holy Spirit and cleanse with the blood of our Lord from head to toe, the five versera and the six entrails, each joint and all nerves, tissues and cells manifest the most high part of creation. I command in the name of Jesus Christ, the enemy devil and Satan, all diseases, bacteria and weaknesses go away. 
all contagious diseases go away. All terminal diseases, endemic diseases, and newly discovered diseases be scorched by the fire of the Holy Spirit, be cleansed, be strengthened. Let there be healing of gastric cancer, lung cancer, uterine cancer, intestinal cancer, and skin cancer, AIDS, leukemia, cerebral apoplexy, heart diseases, lung diseases, all kinds of women's diseases, hypertension, hypotension, diabetes, skin diseases, and inflammation. May polio, paralysis, arthritis, and herniated disc be healed and made perfect. May the pain from lumbar, headache, and neuralgia disappear. May all after effects from a variety of accidents be cleansed and made perfect. May cold, flu, fatigue from sickness, and thyroid diseases be scorched by the fire of the Holy Spirit and be cleansed. Epilepsy, autism, depression, nervous breakdown, and all kinds of mental diseases go away. May all darkness be driven away and let there be joy and peace in their hearts. Father God, by the most high power of creation, may all that is weak be made perfect and whole again. May all that is paralyzed become loosened and may the crippled walk and jump. May the deemed eyesight be brightened. May those with troubled hearing hear well. May the blind receive sight. May the deaf come to hear. May the mute begin to speak. Father, bless those who are unable to conceive, rejoin broken bones, and make perfect and whole all burned parts of the body. Cleanse by the fire of the Holy Spirit those who suffer from addiction of narcotics, drugs, toxicants, and poison. May the dead and dead nerves and cells revive. May all darkness be forced away, and may all evil spirits be driven out. I command in the name of Jesus Christ, the enemy devil and Satan, and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, go away. May all their messengers be also driven out. May all the power of darkness, evil and wicked spirits, dishonest and crafty spirits, estranging and deceiving spirits be driven out. May all chains of injustice be loosened, darkness go away. May the light come, Father God, strengthen their spirits as well as their flesh. Give them the strength to call out to you. Give them the strength to throw away their sins and become sanctified. As each of their soul gets along well, may all in life go well with them, answer the desires of their hearts, imploration and prayer. Add faith, hope and love, and may their families also come to hear and believe in the good news. Protect them from accidents and disasters and bless them to lead prosperous lives without hindrance. Protect all God's children at home, work, and business with the fiery wall of the Holy Spirit and the eyes of the Lord that are like blazing fire. Bless them whether they come in or go out, and bless them to lend to many people but borrow from no one. Give them wisdom and understanding, and allow them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Give all ministers and workers of the Lord the ability to carry out the tasks you have given them. May there also be great revival at each church. Lead your children so that they may give glory to you, whether they eat or drink or whatever they do in life. Manifest your work so that their lips may testify, I have met him, I have experienced God. I have received his answers and I have received God's blessing. Father God, I thank you. May you alone receive all the glory. I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.